You guys were laughing so loud we could hear you outside. It's amazing. Um, it is my absolute pleasure right now to introduce to the stage uh, creator Danny McBride and his fellow cast members Adam Devine and Edie Patterson. You guys are close. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> I wanted to start by asking you, Denny, about the genesis of this, because I read that you went to church a lot growing up, and your mom actually ran a puppet ministry at your local church, so you were very entrenched in that world, but you felt like it was important to ensure that you weren't making fun of religion. So how did you figure out what the overall tone and approach was going to be? Uh, you know, I mean, I think it's really tricky whenever you're doing anything that involves religion. It's obviously a very touchy subject, and it's, you know, you're not supposed to talk about it at the dinner table uh, with strangers and not make comedy shows about it, I think. And, uh, you know, I guess for us, we were just sort of wanting to make sure that, like, the gemstones are the butt of the joke at the end of the day, that we weren't getting, like, cheap laughs because of what someone believes, you know, because that wasn't really kind of what the goal of it was. So it was just for us just trying to you know, for the story to work, this could really be any industry is sort of how we were kind of approaching it, yeah. And I know that originally your first draft, the gemstones were gonna be on the other side of things and they were kind of gonna be the nemesis character. What caused that flip and switch to what we see on screen now? Well, uh, I started, I wrote this pilot and I intentionally didn't go and pitch it to HBO because what always happens whenever I write something or, or pitch something, I'll pitch it, and then as soon as I start trying to write it, it like instantly becomes something else, and then I'm constantly like, oh, but they bought this, but I like this idea better, and then it turns the project into a term paper of like the last <laughs> thing that I wanna work on. So I said, I'll just write this, and then show them what I wanna do. So yeah, my initial idea was that it was going to be a minister who was being blackmailed, he had an affair, and there was like a big mega church that was like doing it. And it just was boring. I, like, I, I had more fun writing for the gemstones. And then I was like, this is probably who the story should just be about or, or these guys. Yeah. And what was it that made you want to dive specifically into the televangelist side of everything? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I moved to Charleston. I, I lived in L.A. for the last 20 years. And we shot Vice Principals in Charleston, South Carolina. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, heard of it. <laughs> we're off to a good start. Uh, <laughs> That's the first time I'd ever been to Charleston, and I just really dug it there. I thought it was awesome, and I have two small kids, and so, uh, yeah, it just seemed like it was a place that David Green, another collaborator of mine, a few of my buddies, yeah, we all just liked it there. So we decided to move there and try to see if we could get, like, a film scene kind of going in that town. And uh, after I moved there, I was just trying to figure out what I wanted to do next, and Charleston is also known as the holy city. It, like, downtown, there's no buildings taller than the church steeples. You go outside of town, and... There's like a church on every other block. The radio stations like are all religious stations. And it just reminded me about my childhood going to church. And so I was just kind of curious of like, what is church like now? And so I started researching these mega churches and yeah, it just seemed like this, the perfect setting for the kind of stories that, that we like to tell usually. And Adam, I know that you grew up with like a little bit of a mix of going tradi to traditional churches, but you'd been to a couple of, of spots like this as well before. Yeah. So what did you draw on from that experience from your childhood? I, uh, I grew up Catholic, so uh, my church was super boring. And <laughs> no, um, it is though, um, let's be real. And, uh, and, and my friends went to like this cool mega church. It wasn't that mega, there's more mega. Uh, churches elsewhere, but uh, uh, they had like rock climbing walls and like a laser tag zone and foosball and like ping pong. And I'm like, I just have stale communion wafers. So I was jealous of all the those church kids. So that's uh, that's kind of where what I was drawing from a little bit. And had you been to any mega churches before Edie, or did you kind of dip your toes in and, and check some out for the process of this show? You know what? I, d I had never been to a mega church. I grew up uh, Episcopalian, and we went for sure every Sunday and to every, you know, every other thing that would happen during the week and vacation Bible school and Sunday school and all that. Um, but we never, I didn't even have friends who went to a mega church. So I didn't even know what, what that was. And I would say my whole experience with it is. Um, Honestly, mostly like YouTube stuff that Danny and, what, Danny and I would watch or like, it's all online for me, yeah. 
And since you'd worked with at, um, Danny before, what was important for you to know about what you were getting yourself into, whether it was the story or your character, or was it just an immediate yes because of the collaboration? Yeah, dude, honestly, um, anything anything Danny asked me to do to, until I'm dead, I'm going to say yes to. Because <laughs> we had such a good time on Vice Principals. Um, yeah, I'll, yeah, I want to work with this dude forever. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, e I'm a by a project by project basis. Yeah, <laughs> we haven't got to that I point yet. Play it by Adam ear. <laughs> well, on the opposite end of the spectrum for you, Adam, I know that you had kind of embarrassingly met Danny and called him a shooting star at a party many years ago. So he's someone that you'd long admired. I did. I, we, I was at. It was like I think it was like the neighbor. He doesn't even remember this. I happening. was too stoned. I don't yeah. even remember meeting him. <laughs> We were at, it was like the neighbor's premiere after party where it's just the actors are in, up in a hotel suite and I had like a small, tiny party in the movie Neighbors and uh, I was up there and there, I'm like, I'm smoking weed with Seth Rogen and I smoke weed but not like Seth Rogen and so I'm just on the moon and Danny taps me on the shoulder and he goes, oh, I know this little guy and I turn around and I go, you're Danny McBride and he's like, yeah. And, and I go, you're a bright shooting star. <laughs> so I was, and he goes, all right, man. <laughs> and, yeah, I was so embarrassed. I grabbed my girlfriend at the time and was like, we've got to go. <laughs> Since you'd had that long gestating admiration of him, when he approached you with this project, was there anything that caused you to pause as to whether you wanted to ruin that idea of who he was or you were just straight in? I just hope he didn't remember that story. <laughs> uh, no, I was really excited. I'm, I'm a big fan of everything that uh, Danny's done. And I, I remember watching Foot Fist Way. Like, we got an advance. Like, my friend Anders, he had a buddy that was in a... Uh, that, like, worked for some agency. And he, we got, a, like, an advance copy of it before it was out and we were like blown away so I was I've been such a fan of his for so long so it was an immediate yes it could have been anything that we were doing I wanted thank to god ask it was something good <laughs> <laughs> thank god yeah I wanted to ask the three of you about um how you determined what you wanted the family dynamic to be between you guys as siblings because it's one of the best things about the show to watch and how you figured out what that tone was going to be and how you were going to interact with each other in all of your scenes you know, I can't, it really kind of came naturally. Like, uh, you know, when we cast for any of this stuff, the, like the chemistry and just actually just being able to get along with people is such an important part of what we do. You know, a lot of this stuff that we make, you know, it's people that I've gone to film school with. So it's guys I've known since I was like 18 years old. And, you know, we have a lot of repeat offenders on here uh, from other projects we've had. So there's definitely a family vibe on the set. And so it's important for us that the people we cast, like, are going to fit into that and are going to be open and you know we don't like any assholes no assholes are is our rule but uh you know with adam it was instantaneous and edie you know i i met edie on vice principles and as soon as she showed up for the first day at work i was just blown away my mouth was like dropped that she would like the nasty stuff that she would say she had <laughs> she was fearless Bad and willing girl. to do anything and uh yeah, and so it just kind of fell into place pretty naturally for me. I'm not sure about these guys, but I just, like, instantly when we did start at the first day of shooting, I was just like, this is going to be fun. This is great. Yeah, for sure. It seemed fun to, like, explore the thing of, with siblings, how it can get so raw so fast, even at, with your adult siblings, and it can regress so quickly into, like, just being awful to each other <laughs> because you know where the buttons are in that other person and you know exactly where to like push them that dynamic is fascinating i think <laughs> yeah i think uh like danny and jody and david like they they have such it, there was such a fun vibe on set that you really felt welcome to like try something new or, or like the weirder the idea the more welcome that was so I feel like that was really freeing and, and helped, especially because I didn't know those these guys that well at all. So it was it was easy and fun for me. I love you guys. I love Aww. you too. We love you, Adam. Aww. You're a shooting star. Put your hand on ours. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to tell that story so many times. I've Ugh. And given with what you were saying before about wanting to be very careful that you're not making fun of religion, that it is making fun of this family and the situation, um, how did you go about determining the tone and making sure that you're playing to the comedy, but that that is always the approach to it? 
You know, I guess like part of, you know, with with Eastbound, that was such a singular show, like following Kenny Powers. And there was a lot of amazing characters in that, like great actors in there. And East and, and Vice Principals was sort of our riff on like the buddy comedy. And so the idea of being able to work with Walton and kind of be able to split that duty. I really just wanted for this to kind of be a riff on the family sitcom. And so I wanted it from the get go to be an ensemble. And I just started kind of looking at other sitcoms that I liked growing up as a kid. And like the one thing that was always in common with all of them was that the uh, you want to spend time with the family. Uh, you like the warmth and you like, you know, the dynamic of all of them. And so I guess for me, it was constantly just finding that balance of like they can be nasty and shitty to each other, but you still should feel like they love each other at the end of the day and that they're actually like a family is demented and messed up as they are, you hope that the best happens for them. <laughs> and is there a unique challenge for all of you as actors? Because your performances are so mixed between very larger than life, but then you're also capturing the emotional nuance in, in kind of a much more intimate way as well on screen at the same time, a lot of scenes. Yeah, you know, that's kind of like, that has really kind of come out of from like working with David and Jody, uh, the other directors that I've worked with on VPs and Eastbound and this, they those guys direct other episodes of this. We all have such different sensibilities that our sort of formula for comedy came from us kind of like working together and trying to figure out everybody's sensibilities and figure out like where it could all meet in the middle. And we kind of quickly found that what we like to do to challenge ourselves is just like, can you get a laugh with something that's so grotesque here and then like two minutes later expect the audience to like be emotionally invested with the person who just said that fucked up stuff? And uh, so we're constantly, I think, trying to do that, I think, just push it. Sometimes we're, we succeed and sometimes I think we don't. It's that, that thing of like if it's, um, if it's true, then it's true. And I think if it's not true, it's not funny. But if it is true, it, like lands on you because we're all just primates and we go like, ooh, ooh, I know that, you know? <laughs> and same with sad things, same with any, like if, if the person saying it is true, then it lands in a certain way. I wanted to ask you about John Goodman as well. He's so superb in the show um, and he's such a stalwart in the comedy world and I was curious for each of you guys kind of what you've taken away and learned from getting the chance to act up against him and perform alongside him. Well, he has like such like, Gravitas mm -hmm. is how you say it. Yeah, um, <laughs> it. It's like when he, when we shot like the first big table scene, like the first time we were shooting around the, the big uh, like church dinner, and it like he, we, we did it in the wide, and then uh, when it came to his close up, he like clocked it into another gear, and I'm like, go! I'm like, I, I was like, oh, I don't, uh, are we supposed to have another gear? <laughs> <laughs> I used all my gears already. <laughs> so, he, I mean, he's, he's, he's very impressive. And he's also, like, s super giving as an actor. And he wants you to do well also. And he's not afraid to, in between takes, like, tell you that something really made him laugh or, or just laugh. I like it better when he just laughs <laughs> instead of going, I liked that one. <laughs> yeah, he's just so good. And he's, I think so embedded in all of our kid brains as someone we've thought was awesome forever. And um, yeah, it's mind blowing that we got to do a show with him. It's like beyond. Yeah, I feel like even by the end of the season, we would still find scenes where we'd like finish a scene with John and be like, John Goodman's in the show. Yeah. Like we were just like, <laughs> it, when scenes with him, it would be tough too. Cause sometimes when he's like railing on us, I'm just sitting there, I'm like, oh, this is my line. I'm like watching him, I'm just watching the show. I I'm feel in like, this scene too. I feel like him being our dad in the show, like gives it an extra air of, of uh, awesomeness. <laughs> I'm bad at talking, but uh, my parents, when they heard like, when I told them I got, was in the show, they're like, oh, cool, good. And then I'm like, John Goodman's playing my dad. They're like, so it's a real show then? Yeah, dad. It was a real show before, but. <laughs> and where did the decision come from when you were crafting the show, Danny, that you wanted him to be a grieving widow? Because it adds so many extra layers to who he is as a character on screen for us as an audience. Well, you know, it just kind of is what the, you know, this is obviously just the first episode, uh, but it, you know, as the story progresses, you sort of figure out 
more about this family and where they came from and how they started. And what becomes very clear is that the person who was really the engine behind this family and the strength behind it was their mom, and she's gone. And so that's sort of what the whole crisis for this family is, is that the person who was driving this machine is no longer behind the wheel, and everyone is sort of looking to see who's going to take the wheel, and nobody's like up to the task. So that's, that's sort of what, this, what the season is, is about. And one of the things I love about your character, Edie, is that she's kind of this powerful woman just sitting in the back line waiting for everyone else to mess up. Was that part of the fun in approaching this character for you? Um, yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's nice that you think she's just waiting. I think she's like <laughs> a- angrily waiting. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, I think it's really, really fun to play um, someone who's frustrated and someone who wants something they don't have yet. Um, yeah, it's it's beyond fun. I mean, she Judy gets to be like a you know, a wild card. She because she's so frustrated, um a lot of times there's no filter and it just like comes sc- screaming out, you know. And that, yeah, that's really fun. <laughs> Edie actually was in the we uh Edie was in the writers room on this. She was one of the writers on the show, so she was able to help craft her character and uh, and add lots of dirty jokes to the whole series. That's, it was that's very good. why the character of Judy is exactly like Edie in real life. That's why. Right. Yeah, she molded it after her real personality. It's called Gravitas. <laughs> <laughs> and for you, Adam, because you're playing a character who is getting is the youth minister and like feels very connected to the youth in a That's slightly exactly like way. Adam's character yeah. Exactly too. Like I, yeah, Kelvin is exactly like me. But were you tapping into and kind of looking at a lot of the real life ministers and kind of celebrity pastors that are doing that for your research? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, I looked at like all the people that run the mega churches that like the pop stars go to because they have like reserved seating for like possible pop stars that want to go to those churches. And those guys, they're, tr- you know, they're like, they really want to be hip and cool. And I'm sure some of them are, but Kelvin's not, but he's trying really hard. And uh, trying really hard is my main thing. So, uh, <laughs> so that's what I brought to the character. I also wonder if you could talk about the decision for your hair to be sticking upright, because I thought that I was an amazing that. choice. I, didn't, I still am, am fighting against that. I feel like I'm going bald because of that. <laughs> they had to flat iron it every day, and every day I just my hair's like, <laughs> and I'm like, is that good? And they're like, it's fine. <laughs> but that was, I think that was your idea, right? I, I, I think so. My, my, I have a seven-year-old son, and he came to set, and he quickly told me that his favorite gemstone yeah. was Kelvin because of his hair. So yeah. it was, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a hairstyle designed to make a seven-year-old happy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I read something as well that it was a bit of a joke that his hair's closer to God because it's yes. sticking up. Yes, we have an episode where uh, possibly he goes to the dark side, and it points down during that episode. <laughs> And similarly, Spoiler. <laughs> when you were mapping out the show, kind of similarly thinking about like the research of actual megachurches, there's so many news stories about pastors who get into trouble with prostitutes or are tax evading and private jets. Were you looking at actual stories or did you feel a need to keep it very distant from that? Uh, you know, I grew up in the South in the 80s, and so, like, Jim and Tammy Faye were in Charlotte with Heritage USA, and I remember even being a kid and just thinking that was wild, that they were building, like, timeshares and water parks, and, like, you could invest and go on vacation with other Christians. I thought it was such a, <laughs> such a crazy idea. And then even just uh, being a kid and seeing Jimmy Swagger cry on TV because he had had sex with a prostitute, I, I mean, I, my mind was just kind of blown away. Like, these are the guys that we listen to all the time? Uh <laughs> So I think I, that was just in, embedded in my head, just seeing that sort of, uh, you know, that people aren't always what they're cracked up to be. And then also because Danny's directing a number of the episodes, I was curious for the two of you is kind of what that gives you as cast members, um, having him on the side as your director behind the camera. Well, it's awesome. Danny directed just the pilot of this season. And um, yeah, I mean, you guys just watched it. It's a, it's a wild ride. I feel like... I feel like you're so good, Danny, at like things that like have momentum and don't stop. But there's there's still like tons of human moments in it. But I feel like you're able to create a ride um, in a way that I think is very interesting. 
Yeah, I think like uh, it. I uh, I didn't like it. I didn't like him. Yeah. Adam's um, not into it. I was I'm really tough. Real, he I was, was really tough on Adam. No, they he, don't talk. There's a reason I'm sitting yeah, in between. Like, they don't speak. Get in the middle, Edie. Uh, no, it was awesome because at any moment you could just check in. There wasn't like. Oh, he's the director. He's sitting back there, and you have to wait for him to maybe give you direction or maybe not. There was like no division, and so it was easy to be like, "Oh, could I do it like this?" And he was always like, "Do it a any which way. We'll we'll try everything." And and but also like keep the pace moving along so it doesn't just feel like you're shooting the one scene all day long. So we we were, we're really cooking, but also getting to try a lot of fun things. And what was the point in your career when you first realized that you were really interested in directing? Because I always think it's so great when actors direct because you have such an understanding of how everything on a set works already. You know, I kind of like backed into acting because, you know, I went to film school to uh, to learn how to direct. And that's where I met Jody Hill and David Green. And so it was completely by accident that I became an actor. We went to this art school in North Carolina and there was a film school and a drama school and a dance department. And the drama dean was like dead set against the drama students working with the film students. He didn't want them to like ruin their craft of what he was instilling <laughs> in them. So that just meant that like the film students just had to act in each other's movies because we weren't allowed access to the actors. And so, uh, yeah, then that's how I got a career in this. <laughs> And how involved do you like to stay in any of the directing choices when it's someone like David Gordon Green or any of the other directors on the show? You know, I like that, that with everything, with all with my collaboration with those guys, we really just don't have any rules about it. Even like when we show up and do these shows together, it's all completely organic. There's no sort of like, you know, you have to come back and do this. It's There's just a friendship there and a trust in everybody's instincts that that's what's kind of fun about it is everyone just coming in and throwing their own thing onto it. So I'll run the writer's room. Uh, but I trust David and Jody's sensibilities enough that I'm good with them making choices and adding upon things and changing it. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be there if I think something goes off the rails, but usually when it goes off the rails, it excites me. I like that. And so, uh, yeah, and then I'm very involved through all of the post, and so I'll, uh, you know, make sure that the story tracks and everything's there. But I think that's what's kind of fun about this is just bringing in all these different creative minds and seeing what you could, you know, cook up that you wouldn't have done by yourself. And when you're casting for a project, what sort of tone and ambience and kind of like what's your style in the casting room? Because obviously you've been on both sides of that. Yeah, I mean, it's really, really tough. I, you know, when we cast, I mean, I, I see so many people come in and everyone, you know, can be great. But it's like when you're in there and you've written it, you just know what you're looking for. And so someone could come in and be incredible. But from the moment they walk in, you know, this isn't who it is. Uh, and it's tough. I mean, there's not an easy way around that. And uh you know, so I guess what we're always looking for, though, with the stuff we do particularly is that someone could be comedic and be dramatic, that there's uh, that you can do kind of what Edie was saying, where it can be grounded uh, and then on a dime you can shift to comedy. And so a lot of times I think in the room we'll be more impressed by someone just being believable as opposed to somebody having like some kind of sharp comedic timing, because I feel like if you know how to be believable and you can be relatable, then all that other stuff can kind of come with it. And then, Edie, I know when you were starting out, you did a lot of improv. Um, yeah, still do. Still do. But I was curious, kind of like, what that initial training and the, those early years, like, how that still comes into play when you're walking onto the set of a show like this. Yeah, I mean, we, the scripts were really, really good for this show. And so a lot of times we, I mean, all the time, we would make sure we got what was written. And, but, you know, if it's a scene with uh, me and Danny or me and Danny and Adam, there would would always be room to go for things to open up a little bit. And um, th these dudes are awesome improvisers. And so, yeah, it was just always fun to go, oh, I, I feel like I really would say this right now. Judy would say this. And then to know that they're just going to keep going with the truth of it. Nobody's going to try to make a joke or say a, a quippy thing. We'll just keep going with the truth of our characters um, so that's where the improv is really fun on this show is knowing like I can just stay in it and they're going to go with me. Yeah. yeah. And then Adam, you obviously started out doing a lot of sketch comedy and then co-created Workaholics and, and we're kind of running that show for several seasons. <laughs> and I'm interested in kind of your takeaway when you come onto a show like this, like are you still looking at how everything's running and thinking about the way that you would run your next show? Uh... 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, for sure. You, I, I think like since that's kind of how I came into that was like my first real mm -hmm. job uh, was being like the creator of a show. So I, I like don't know any other way other than to like think about it from that perspective. Um, but it's also like I feel so comfortable with these guys knowing that they there's a steady hand on the wheel that I'm I'm not like going like are we gonna where are we getting there? <laughs> Are we doing everything right? Uh, so I f felt super comfortable just, you know, kind of sitting back. It was it was weird, like, having the amount of, like, downtime because it's a big ensemble show. So it was weird, like, only working a couple days a week. I found myself just getting fat. <laughs> <laughs> You'll watch. When you watch the season, I'm just like... <laughs> <laughs> I have more time to go out to eat, so... <laughs> it's a blessing and a curse. What was the question? Yeah. <laughs> and for each of you, what did you find to be like the most challenging part of your character and the most like kind of like the bit that you had to work on the most or, or figure out their motivations for? I'll tell you what I had to work on the most is I have a I had to do a dance number at one point and I had to practice it over and over and over and over and over and over. And I would do it in the the garage of the house where I was staying and my roommates would just hear me down there with metal hitting metal in the cement floor of the garage and screaming fuck and starting the video over and then <laughs> dancing again. Um, that w It sounds so like technical and lame, but that was the hardest part for me because it's, um, it's not a natural thing to my brain to like learn choreography real quick. So I would just have to hammer it and, and hammer it. wasn't it. just choreography, it was clogging. Yeah, it right? was clogging. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you want to go show them now. <laughs> we brought your clogging shoes. We <laughs> this is the point where I realize like I'm in a dream. And I'm like, <laughs> I look down, I'm nude. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, for me, it was, uh, I think, uh, like the accent. I've never really done an accent and like, I did a, a like a little bit of it, so I was like, <laughs> it was a real fine line between like being offensively, I'm doing an accent of a southern person, and like hitting that sweet spot. So it was it was trying to find that, and I think I found it through sh throughout the season. Uh, it would come in and out, and I'd have to be aware of that. Were you ever in the edit bay going like, what the fuck is Adam doing? No, your accent was always on point. You I'm like, hey, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why did he? <laughs> How about for you, Danny? Uh, you know, I think for me, it, ha it has to do a lot with just like trying to focus on the character. There's so many spinning plates uh, when you're show running and acting in it. And just like you're thinking about so many things. You're thinking about, fuck, we're like taking too long in this scene. And we got three other scenes today to do. And. Uh, so I think it's about like trying to when the cameras roll to like shut off that part of your brain and just focus on like what you're there for. Yeah. And I wanted to jump to a couple of questions that we got from the audience earlier. The first one being from Lauren and Cassidy, who wanted to ask all three of you, what were your lives like living in Charleston during the show? I mean, it was awesome. It was uh, it's like the most beautiful city. Um, we stayed on like this island just outside of the city. And so we're like close to the beach. I had a little golf cart. Uh, so life was pretty odd. I had more people visit me in Charleston than any other movie or show I've ever shot anywhere. <laughs> like if I'm if I'm in Louis, like Baton Rouge, Louisiana, people are like, I'm good, have fun, see you when you're back. Yeah. But everyone came to visit here. Yeah, it's just it's pretty great. Um, we did Vice Principals there, and that was the first time I'd ever been to Charleston, and it's kind of mind blowing. It's one of the best food cities in America, in my opinion. And then you just sort of like realize it, it's got so many cool aspects. And then, yeah, like Adam was saying, when we started shooting, we all moved out to um, this island, sort of like 15 minutes from downtown. And yeah, you would just like text someone and go, wanna ride bikes to the restaurant? <laughs> you know, like it was, it's kind of a beautiful, amazing thing. I feel like all of us were so grateful for it. Like we would lay down at night and go, thank you God for this life <laughs> shooting this show. <laughs> Do you find that shooting on location lends itself to your performances because you're naturally spending so much more time in each other's pockets than you would be if you're just coming from home? I've, I've always found that. I, I feel like when you're on location, you tend to focus just solely on what's happening, uh, which I think is good. It's nice. That's good. I think as a cast member, that's nice. Uh, 
But there's something also about Charleston that's just so like relaxing and the people are just so kind there that it was also nice that after you work, it was just very easy to like shut it down and like you just look at the ocean or whatever and it would just kind of get you in a good headspace to like not be too stressed out about all the stuff that was happening. I think you guys did a good pitch for the Charleston Tourism Board just there. (laughs) We worked for them. Yes. Uh, This next question is from Carrie. Being cast in mostly comedic roles for all of you, how do you keep the funny fresh for yourselves? I feel like uh, trying not to retread on old bits. Like, even if you know, like, this ba da 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 works really well, like, trying to surprise yourself and do something different uh, is exciting, and that's it's what keeps it fresh for me, for sure. Uh, I would say what keeps it fresh for me is if I just just remember that thing that I was saying before of just, just mean, mean what I'm saying and just... Uh, yeah, find the truth in it and just really mean it, no matter what it is. Even if it's the craziest thing that I've ever seen written on a page, just mean it. And also, like, when you, I, like, always have to stop and think, like, if I'm ever getting stressed out about something or or I'm not thinking I'm doing a good job or X, Y, Z, you just have to think, like, this was this has been my dream my entire life ever since I was a little kid, and it now it's actually happening and just to enjoy the ride and have fun with it. And you're not always going to be awesome and you're going to have off days. And But then the next day you will have a great day. And to just to try to stay in it and realize that uh, the dream is coming true. I also wanted to ask, like, assuming hopefully that we get more seasons of the show, what... Oh, yeah, that's going to happen. That's going to happen. Your, mom, your mom's Head of HBO. <laughs> Thank you. What aspects of your characters would you look forward to kind of like exploring and going deeper on the most if that happens? I mean, this season is pretty crazy. Like, is is what happens in here is the is the tip of the iceberg. It goes, it, it the season goes in places that I don't think you would be, ever be able to imagine from this pilot. Uh, so I, I mean, I just you know, uh, writing this thing, you know, we've everything from Eastbound to VPs. Those things always had an ending in sight that was pretty short and pretty compact. And this is a story that, if I had my way, I, I would. I have an idea or vision for it that would be pretty massive, where you end up meeting all these other family members and. Uh, yeah, so I just would be interested in exploring this world more, and hopefully we get a chance to do it. My my thing is I, I like the idea of um, seeing what, uh, yeah, just seeing the different relationships go down into the well and see like, oh, what's it like if um, so and so and so and so are together for a while, and oh, what do they talk about, and what what are their jokes, and like, how is their thing, and yeah, I just think there's so many interesting characters in the mix that I, uh, I just like seeing them with each other. Yeah, I think like f- exactly like r- this few episodes, uh, the, the first couple, you could tell like, oh, these people are together, these people are together, and these people, and it'll be fun uh, to really start mixing it up and, and hanging with other cast members um, it, within the show. Well, you guys have done such a fantastic job with this. I think within the first 30 seconds, I was bent over laughing at home. And you know exactly what type of show it's going to be, which is fantastic. Uh, The show is on HBO August 18th. Please tell all your friends about it. And thank you so much for coming out tonight. Thank you guys for coming.